How can big data epidemiology, real world data, and clinical data help pharmaceutical companies better target future drug design and development? The presentation was originally compiled and delivered in October 2016. I am narrating it in September 2021 as it is much more important now than ever. Here is a brief outline of the presentation. First I speak about big data for total evidence synthesis at population level using patient level outcomes of real world healthcare data, clinical studies, and observational studies. Then I will illustrate what I call ensemble outcome modeling of efficacy and safety outcomes of disease populations, which I also call epidemiologically landscaping of therapeutic effects and during this presentation you will learn also that this is in some way to fill the gaps in the theoretical foundation that we have or the lack of theoretical foundation that we have in epidemiology and clinical sciences that is medicine that will actually enable us to do many more things and I will bring out some more. And then I will illustrate utilizing the landscape for stratification of patient populations. And that will help us to identify objectively the unmet need where the patients are not benefiting from existing uh, treatment. That can be utilized for drug target discovery and throughout the development phase, the clinical development phase from early to late and then finally at the very large stage of getting to the patients illustrating the benefit risk in high precision for each segment of the population rather than in a broad based benefit risk assessment that is being performed today. Let's have a look at experimentation. There are sciences with strong basic theory like astronomy and particle physics. On the other hand, there are sciences without having a strong basic theory, like epidemiology and clinical sciences or medicine. When there is an underlying strong basic theory that provides them a framework for designing experiments according to the theory. So the experiments are in general well designed. designed. There is another way of looking at it in the sciences. There are sciences with traditions of control experiments and there are sciences without having a tradition of control experiments. Now if you look at astronomy, although there is a strong basic theory, there is no tradition of controlled experiments. In astronomy they use the basic theory to design the experiments more thoroughly However, as they cannot control some of the variables or the variables, that is, that is, they cannot control the heavens, they are restricted to observe. On the other hand, if you look at particle physics, they design the experiments according to the theory, identify variables that are controlled, and then identify the variables that are measured and design the experiment very well and 
make up the setup and then conduct the experiment. In epidemiology, there is no basic theory and also there is not much of a tradition of controlled experiments. So they are primarily on observational experiments. And they perfect the experiment, but nevertheless not a tradition of you know, controlled experiments. But on the other hand, in medicine or in clinical sciences, although there is no basic theory, they do conduct controlled experiments. So the randomized controlled trials or randomized clinical trials or RCTs as they are known are, are in some ways the perfection of experiments, experimentation and especially experimentations on humans. And there the idea is that the randomization means of keeping the comparators equal, removing um, any so-called confounders. However, in very large scale experiments, global scale experiments, scale experiments, the randomization may not be perfect. So here in 21st century, there is a tendency to conduct global experiments and also conduct the experiment in real world settings. So therefore, if we were to fill up the theoretical space with at least, at least some rudimentary basic theory that would enable us to design better experiments and also build up analytical frameworks which are much more thorough than what is done in normal comparisons in there. If you look at this particular presentation and one of the topics that I attempt to address is this building up of this basic theoretical or semi-theoretical framework which enables us to conduct experiments. The theoretical framework is actually based on epidemiology or the disease epidemiology with the invent of the big data, the availability of the big data of health, electronic health records, very large longitudinal cohorts, observational studies, biomarker studies, and other studies where patient level data are available. If we actually integrate this data, it, it provides us with the means to define a thorough framework. And then you will see that during this presentation, I talk about such a, present, such a framework and sometimes I call it a epidemiological landscape or a statistical landscape. In this slide, I'm going to discuss two points, very important points. They're related. The first one from David Hand, who used to be the president of the Royal Statistical Society. He makes the point that the aim of a clinical trial is not really to work out whether the drug A is superior to drug B on average, but to enable the decision to be made, which drug should the medics be prescribing to the patient who is walks into the, to the clinics next. So here the word average is important. And this point is also taken up in the next much better. There are the two subtle points are made. One is an effect of a treatment or a drug. There are 
it goes on to say, how do we know that all changes induced by the drugs are normally distributed? As you know, the normal distribution is a kind of a bell-shaped curve where the mean effect is achieved of them and then others are spread, some are less, some are more, but it is a symmetrical-shaped, bell-shaped curve. So it, it, it's, it's a very important point, and then go, go in, they go on to say that, well, actually, in general, it doesn't. Uh, some have, patients have, might be affected more than the others, and the uh, given that the very many other factors involved, uh, the distribution may not be symmetric. The same point actually comes in a different angle, is that is that when we actually conduct different different experiments and then when we synthesize them together uh, that is how we actually build up our evidence-based medicine where uh, multiple studies are often conducted different part of the world in different populations are synthesized together using a methodology known as meta-analysis the meta-analysis means most of these are synthesized using the summary level, summaries of each individual studies. And then uh, when the meta-analysis is performed, we derive some measures for individual studies and then collate them into the totality. Um, using that, uh, we come to a conclusion uh, for evidence-based medicine. Here, the main, same points are made. When you actually perform a meta-analysis, the confidence intervals of a meta-analysis describe the variance of the mean effect. Not, not the range of effects, while the mean change characterizes the impact of a drug on a group of patients, the range more fully described or characterized its, its effects on individuals, specifically on individual studies. And a very big point on treating individual patients. In general, the medics consider patients as individuals rather than a group. So if you go to a clinic and the medic tells you that um, I'll treat you like an average patient. Average patient. Um, I'm not sure very many people will be happier. So this is these two are very important points. They're all um, relevant to these different different effects and different different uh, patients, and then fusing these in decision making is very very important. In a previous slide I discussed very briefly building up a basic theory or rudimentary basic theory which might help us to design better experiments in epidemiology and clinical sciences and medicine. This is actually enabled by the availability of big data in health during the 21st century, electronically available various various data. Uh, this is a slide I picked up from a publication in JAMA, and it, it actually makes the point very nicely that there are obviously collections of structured data that, for, if you want to say, they are properly formatted uh, in in some ways. And there are, of course, unstructured data. With the advent of AI and other machine learning, or deep learning, it is possible to fuse these two, especially getting more unstructured data processed and linked with structured data. And then the another thing, the y-axis here pointed out, you can link the data sources from very many other so, so some of them, of course, electronic health records, which might contain things like medication, demographics, encounters, diagnosis, procedures, um, and uh, and few more data points. 
from uh, personal health records. And then you, you get others like diagnostics um, and other stuff, especially these days with home treatment monitors. And then completely different, uh, completely health-related data like complete, complete genomes and genetics are usually available in um, linked sometimes other systems but because of privacy they're not totally linked and then the new kinds of or, or maybe they existed for a long time but into this domain this is new is this, this social history family history symptoms lifestyle socioeconomic data and social networks even um, they are there are innovative ways of linking this data if allowed and then, of course, the environmental data, uh, they're all relevant. Now, the important point is that if you meditate in front of this particular diagram for a few minutes, you would get a good understanding of the vastness of the data that might be available. And if these data are available from the total nation or something approximating the total global population, that would enable us to build up a, a some sort of a framework that gives a, a platform that with some tools build coordinate system or a landscape. We'll talk a little bit more about it empirically so that you can we can use these this landscape as a co as a coordinate system to design and execute better experiments now i mentioned several times about the landscape or the coordinate system here are some instructions of how to build such a landscape or a coordinate system as I mentioned, this landscape is actually, or the coordinate system is built using epidemiology. So, as you know, heterogeneity, that is differences among individuals, is common to most chronic diseases. Heterogeneity can be described or studied by the outcomes that are routinely collected from the patients. The outcomes, both of efficacy and safety, can be statistically modeled to describe the heterogeneity using the empirically derived statistical model. Model. The boundaries can be established to form clusters of patients with similar outcome profiles. This is done in two steps. One. You have large number of variables describing the outcomes of safety and efficacy. And then first we do is that we reduce into few, uh, not two, but often four, five, six, seven, rather than hundreds from the original uh, coordinate system. And then you can actually use this particular coordinate system as I make in the, um, the last point here, as it is to model all other effects and perform comparisons or alternatively for making it easier for understand easier to understand for uh, people involved especially for medics and others you, we could actually take those multi multiply reduced coordinate system and then uh, create clusters to show the patients who are similar uh, outcome profiles and that way, it is sometimes easier to visualize these groups of patients. And then on the original scale, as I mentioned, this reduced coordinate system itself can be used to model the, any outcomes or the comparisons. And some of you are familiar with this, the concept called propensity scores, where well, there are some unobserved variables. They could actually utilize these in observational studies to give a equal footing for comparisons. Here, you can use this 
particular coordinate that we derived as universal coordinate system for propensity, uh, uh, universal propensity scoring system to model and assess the effects of treatments. And they can also be used to design experiments much more. So this is the fundamental, uh, rudimentary theory. It's not rudimentary, but nevertheless, it is say it's not as the theories in other sciences, but this is an empirically derived from big data. And having such a theory, such a coordinate system enables us uh, completely. Here are some further observations on this landscape. Uh, the segments I mentioned, the clusters, they are often also called phenotypes. Um, these actually can be described um, in terms of the original scale of variables or the clinical outcomes, safety and uh, efficacy outcomes, so that you can know what these landscapes mean, clinical meaning of the phenotypes. And also, the, the landscape, I'll talk about a little bit more, there is a slide on it, um, can be used to derive what we call unmet need, which everybody knows. But here is an empirically deriving the unmet need rather than asking opinion of individuals. So this is evidence-based medicine at best, where you will see in certain phenotypes are served very well with the existing therapies. And there are certain phenotypes, uh, patients are not treated or, or, or benefiting very much from the existing treatment. That is a clear need of unmet need. And we can actually use the landscape to identify them objectively, characterize them. And then I will talk about in the next slide a little bit more, um, how do you identify it? What's, what's going on in these particular phenotypes. I just mentioned that in certain phenotypes or certain clusters, the patients are not benefiting from existing treatment very much. So it's very important to find out what can we do objectively to enhance their this is state to slow the progression or put them into remission or, or, if at all possible. In order to do that, we would need to find out what is happening at the molecular level in those patients, patient groups or clusters. So the, also as a uh, 21st century asset is this large collections of molecular data repositories has been established in various cases, one of the major uh, movements is the so-called biobanks, where certain sections of the populations are completely uh, molecular phenotyped or, or molecular level characterized. And then other measurements are also collected, gene expression, protein expression, mutations, and other bio biomolecular measures. And there are others, other cohorts, and even commercial domain patient level data exists. So what we do is that we follow the same process, um, like the clinical outcomes that we and safety outcomes that we mentioned. We reduce the dimensions, and then statistically model them, and then if needed, cluster them. Um, if we do that, they are usually called endotypes, and then we map them and overlay them into the phenotypes or the therapeutic landscape that I described before. Once we've done that, these the biomolecular measures are or can be used as specs to explore what's going on with each landscape, especially the ones with so-called unmet need where the patients are performing very poor uh, to the existing treatment that would actually lead into um, developing new therapies using these signatures as the, uh, the way into these patients and, and exploring the bio various biological pathways that are affected and the likewise. 
In the same way, we can utilize these to move existing therapies into these domains. We don't want to use the term uh, reusing or, or the existing treatment, but nevertheless, you could do it in two ways. One, of course, repurposing existing treatment that has not been used. And second is that more importantly, the combinations of treatments. Um, as you know, the combinations are becoming in certain diseases, uh, in, in fact, coming to the uh, four areas, even cures for the diseases. So this is a framework that can be utilized. And then you will see in a slide, the same can be used with, to design experiments much more with high precision, and then also execute these experiments in an iterative fashion using the framework. This slide summarizes what I've discussed so far. As we have learned, we would use the clinical outcomes or the clinical measurements of the patients obtained from the patients longitudinally often and then reduce the dimensions and then statistically model them. And naturally, uh, even though we reduce the dimensions, there's still more than two dimensions. Here in this particular diagram, I actually show two dimensions of them. Often, we would have more dimensions in the coordinate system, two, three, four, five, likewise. It's a systematic process to select the best number of dimensions. Once we've done that, we can do arithmetic on that landscape. One of the arithmetics is to segment them, identifying the phenotype or cluster of them. Is to use them as a coordinate system for any experiment that we design based on this particular coordinate system. And then, as I described, we overlay the molecular measurements or obtained from the same or similar patients. And here you see them as a gray arrows overlaid. What you see underneath is the dots of patients. And then what is specified in the gray arrows are the molecular measurements and the of the array is proportional to the, the driving force applied by this particular molecular measurement. And then in the boxes I see some labels, they are actually the names of those molecular measurements. And clearly, uh, as I mentioned, this is multi-dimensional space, but we can see, see it in the two dimensions clearly. And then let's assume a target, which is targeting two molecular entities. We have a target, a drug target, and then using the landscape, we can figure out the optimal population which may have an effect on that. The circles drawn on them are basically doing arithmetic on these patients, and then we can calculate how much of an effect this particular target might have on this particular population. So this is, so this is a, in some ways, you could do the molecular analytics tool as well as it is really a study design tool, a precise, more precise study design tool than some ad hoc approaches that has been, that's based on gut feeling. And so this is very objective, empirically derived. So we can actually go forward in therapeutic development more systematic way. As we go on, we develop uh, clinical studies, often randomized controlled trials of a variety of degree, and we can overlay those data, and then we can fine tune this landscape. And this is very well captured by the little um, sentence, a conversation between Alice and the Cheshire cat in Lewis, um, Lewis Carroll's 
Alice in Wonderland. As you probably have seen this or heard this, Alice wants to go somewhere, but she doesn't know where to go. And then um, I hope you followed the advice from the cat. If she doesn't care where she goes, then it doesn't really matter. She can hang around and walk along enough. You will go somewhere and, and oftentimes what happens in a therapeutic development is that you will actually finish the time of registration of the new molecular entity as the target and then the, the time of the licensing and basically the drug is set. Spend 20 years. And alternatively, we can adopt this schematic or this method to more systematically, and I sometimes refer to this one, engineer the therapeutic intervention so that within a shorter period of time you can bring about therapy overcoming the, the fallout that we have. So this particular coordinate system helps us to systematically guide therapeutic development from the jury through the clinical development process and then illustrating the benefit risk profiles of the treatments to the payers of these particular drugs. Okay, thank you very much for your attention and thank you very much for participating in this discussion. I've been going through several topics, important topics, and I try to make as simple as possible. And it probably provides in-depth coverage of what I'm trying to get at from the developing of a theory for health or the diseases or the disease epidemiology to build up an operational environment for uh, achieving many things including experimental design and targeted, targeted therapy development and the likewise. So hopefully everything has been clear enough but some of these uh, require further discussion and I have several other presentations um, explaining some of them in detail and then if you have any particular questions I'm very happy to answer you'll see my link in contact details in the slide and um, if you google my name um, the LinkedIn address or the link to my LinkedIn profile will come in and um, I'm very very happy to be in touch with you while LinkedIn so hopefully uh, this has been useful to you and uh, thank you very much. <laughs>